Okay, here we go. Now, now it's official, okay? Uh, welcome to the class, everyone. If you have any questions that you don't record it, uh, you can always speak to me after, send me a note, a call, whatever. Um, but, um, okay, let, let's, let's finally get started. Again, apologies for the late start, but we, we, this was scheduled for right after Shul and, and we, we were waiting for our minion. And so it just it just took a little bit longer than, uh, than I thought. So my apologies for that. Okay. Um, the um, last class, we were, were going through the Jewish calendar. We, is that right? We were in, in Roman net room three letter C, or did we get to all the way to D? Do you remember? Sorry, about, oh no, do we? Sorry, you finished that. We're already up to Roman number four. Is that right? I'm sorry, it's been a few weeks and I was out of time. Does someone remember better than I what we had gotten up to? Yeah, we're somewhere in. Didn't we get to like the different like, we just, we're, we're start, transfer of tastes and stuff? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You're absolutely right. We already got to, sorry, we're Roman number four. So the laws of kosher, that's absolutely right. And last time we talked about like the laws of kosher food that you would find in the Torah itself, like kind of what are the, what are those um, uh, kind of literal, uh, what was what's found directly in Torah? And then we talked about the rabbinic extension, what, you know, how kosher, um, like keeping kosher that is, um, you know, that you wouldn't know just from the Torah itself. And the main thing we got was like, this is Roman numeral four, letter C, I would say, really, and, and D, E, F, okay, which is that um, in the, the, the rabbis as they devise and, and, and sort of elaborate on the rules of kosher eating as found in the Torah, they, they say we're concerned not just with the thing itself, but also with its taste. And so we're concerned about the taste of something non-kosher being absorbed into pots and pans and utensils. Uh, and, so, and so because of that, not only is it, um, you know, not only do we not eat pigs and shellfish, et cetera. We also don't eat, you know, uh, we, we only eat food cooked in exclusively kosher kitchens, okay? We made with exclusively kosher utensils because we're worried about the taste being absorbed into the pots and pans and then the taste being expunged, uh, being absorbed and then leaving into the next item that, that it's. So the way you imagine it, um, um, uh, you know, you, you have like your, your, your pork roll, you, you have your bacon in your frying pan and a little bacon taste gets absorbed into the walls of the frying pan. And then, you know, two hours later, you want to fry an egg and the bacon taste leaves the frying pan and goes into the bacon. Now, this may seem a little strange to you. That's, if that's true, it's because you're using uh, um, what you call stainless steel uh, utensils, which is a amazing miracle creation of the 20th century. But before stainless steel was discovered, uh, People had cast iron pans. If you use a cast iron pan, uh, it will actually retain the taste and you will, it, it'll impart that taste in the next thing you cook in that pan. So this is actually based in reality, okay? It's going to be observed reality. Or if you have a wooden cutting board, if you cut an onion on a wooden cutting board and then you cut an apple on that cutting board, it will taste like onion, right? The taste gets absorbed in the cutting board and that wood, and then it gets expelled, it's uh, imparted into the next new cut that my wife is always yelling at me for using. She has a cutting board she exclusively uses for onions and garlic, and I sometimes use it for other things. And she says, you're ruining my whatever, you're ruining this because it tastes like onion now, like you can't eat it. So, okay, um, that she's right. And, and that laws of passion reflect her uh, understanding that actually tastes are transferred, okay? Excuse me, I'm gonna have a seltzer. I'm sorry, a little thirsty. I'm sorry, I can't share, okay. okay. So, so that so the rabbinic system of kashrut again is built on this assumption that we're worried about taste being imparted and, and transferring, et cetera. But there are also rules for how and, and so the rules for how that functions um, that I think are based on the rabbi's approximation of the physical reality of this phenomenon of the transfer of taste. So, and we keep to those rules and approximations even though we can't necessarily replicate all of the actual perceived reality of, can I taste a little bit of bacon in this eggs or not? Or, you know, what are the, so we say, right, well, the rabbis figured it out, the rules of how taste is transferred and we apply those rules. Now, the simplest way to apply them is just, again, to cook everything in the exclusively kosher kitchen, then you don't have to worry about it, okay? Um, so I compare the, I, I don't know if I, if I um, shared this analogy uh, last time, 
it's not my just it's not my idea, but I find it very helpful. Um, if you think about um, if you were to compare learning how to drive a car to an insurance company accident report. Okay, did I, did I, did I say this last time? No, okay, good. An insurance company accident report is the red Toyota went through the red light and collided with the gray Subaru at a 90 degree angle at 30 miles per hour. And these are the consequences of that, of that crash. And that's what, you know, accident reports that the insurance companies make or that the police file an accident report, that's what it would look like. That's what it's based on. But if you're learning how to drive, like the point is don't crash into anyone else, right? That's what being a good driver, being a good driver is don't crash your car into someone else's car, right? Stay, don't crash into anything if you're, if you're driving. And learning how to drive is all about avoiding collisions. So maintaining a kosher kitchen is about avoiding collisions. You don't want any contamination of anything non-kosher in your kosher kitchen. And we keep meat and dairy separate, right? So you don't want any contamin cross-contamination within your kosher kitchen of meat foods and dairy foods. And we have separate pots and separate pans and maybe separate sink liners. And we you know, keep things in separate places and cook them and prepare them separately and eat them on separate dishes. All of that is to avoid any contamination. The actual details of the laws of kosher, the laws of kosher eating are all about what happens when there is a collision. If you take your dairy spoon and you accidentally stick it into your chicken soup and stir, is the chicken soup contaminated? Is the spoon contaminated? And what's the outcome of this, of this accident? Okay. And that's the law. And the laws of Kashu are very detailed and, and quite elaborate um, explorations of what happens when these collisions occur. But if you're like, but the like how to of keeping a kosher kitchen is like don't have collisions, okay? Keep everything separate, two sets of everything, you know, don't have non-kosher ingredients in your home, and then you're not gonna have collisions. Okay. So when there are, but there are inevitably going to be collisions, or there often are, especially if you have dairy and meat in the same kitchen, which most of us do. Um, and um, so some, some, some rules. We're concerned about impartment of taste. So if, um, so, um, so, so the rules of how taste is imparted, one, so some assumptions of these rules. Um, I'm not gonna go through them in great detail. One of the books on the, on the, that's listed on the curriculum is Rabbi Pinny Cohen's Practical Guide to Kashri, which goes through these laws in greater detail. And for, whatever, for various reasons of history and whatever acts of the history or Maybe it's more, more significant. Um, a significant part of the rabbinic, classic rabbinic education is the detailed study of the laws of kosher food and what happens to these collision uh, consequences, okay? So you can spend the better part of a year studying these, these rules. We're, gonna, we're not gonna spend the better part of a year. So um, <clears throat> we'll just go over a few, a few fine points. It's an assumption that less than 60 times um, the taste can't be shared in less than 60 times its value. So if a little drop of milk falls into a big pot of chicken soup, you can't remove the milk. So it's there in this big mixture. It sort of vanishes into this big mixture of chicken soup. Um, if the milk is less than 60 times the volume of the soup, we assume it did not impart any taste and the chicken soup remains kosher. Okay. If you have a dairy spoon, that you accidentally stick into your chicken soup to stir your chicken soup. So then it would depend. We assume the dairy spoon was entirely filled with dairy from all the dairy cooking you were doing, you know, a few, sometime earlier. And so when you stick it into your chicken soup, all of that stored up dairy taste, then the theory is equal to the volume of the spoon itself is expunged and goes into the chicken soup. And so if the chicken soup is 60 times the volume of the spoon, every, the chicken soup is fine which is most likely the case. If the chicken soup is not 60 times the volume, maybe it's a bowl, not a pot, then the chicken soup is not kosher anymore. What about the spoon? The spoon has absorbed now the dairy taste from being a dairy spoon. And now it's absorbed the chicken soup taste because you suck it in the chicken soup. So the spoon has to be purified and made kosher again. We do that by immersing it in boiling water because we assume that the same way the taste came in, the taste goes out. So in boiling chicken soup, chicken goes in, contaminates with the, the dairy taste already in there. Now you have a forbidden mixture of dairy and meat inside the spoon. 
So I drop it in boiling water, the taste leaves the spoon and it's purified again. The way things go in, that's how they go out. Um, and that works when it's that, that can contaminate and it can also decontaminate if you put something in boiling water to kosher to purify. Um, we also assume that tastes that have been absorbed inside a spoon or a pot for more than 24 hours become rancid. Uh, and so if they then leave, um, they, they depart the pot or spoon or whatever and go into something else, contaminate something else, they're contaminating that other thing with rancid taste. So if your spoon has not been used, your dairy spoon was not used for 24 hours and you accidentally use it to stir your chicken soup, so the, and even if there isn't 60 times lying in chicken soup, the dairy taste in that spoon is now 24 hours old dairy taste, which is a rancid dairy taste. And when it leaves the spoon and goes into the soup, it can't make it non-kosher because this law that the taste is like the thing itself is only if it's a good taste, a positive taste. If it's a rancid taste that makes it taste worse, it's not gonna, it can't contaminate. It's a very important, that's a very practical because usually when accidents happen, they happen with old pots and pans, meaning old meaning they have been used for 24 hours. So whatever taste is absorbed, that was has been for at least 24 hours. And so it's not gonna be able to uh, contaminate the thing it goes into. Um, these are probably the most relevant rules of how taste is imparted or, or, or you know, it's gonna be come up if there's an accident, but like really you should, you know, especially the first few times any accident happens, you should call me or text or even write me or, you know, your local Orthodox whomever, call a rabbi. This is what we get a lot of questions about. It's, oh, I accidentally, or my mother-in-law was visiting and she didn't know that it was a dairy spoon because it looks just like her meat spoon. Or, you know, our uh, housekeeper came and she, or my non-Jewish roommate, you know, was eating a ham sandwich and some, you know, food, some of it, some of the crumbs got in my blah, 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 right? So like call and we can, we can talk it through. Usually, often there are solutions that are not, you know, that are not dire to solve the, these problems when they happen. But, uh, but that, that's, that's a great reason to ask and we can, we can figure it out. Um, any questions, comments on this? Okay. The best way to avoid this is just again, to keep, you know, don't have non-kosher ingredients in your home, okay? Uh, and keep dairy and meat items, you know, cook dairy and meat items in separate pots and pans. Um, and dairy foods and meat foods should be served on separate pots and pans and don't serve non-kosher things on your, on your dishes or cook them in your pots and pans. Okay, then, then you don't really have to know so much, right? Then you just, then, then, and then you're back in how to drive and the way to drive is to avoid collisions. You don't have to learn about all the consequences of, uh, you know, the, these various uh, collisions of non-kosher and kosher under various circumstances. Um, okay, so... In terms of some of these um, uh, specific um, like ways to do that, let's sort of sort of just make sure we sort of go over them. Um, so in Roman numeral four, um, we talked about not. We sorry, we talked. We did a kosher species, and that's listed in the Torah that we did last time. Non-kosher parts of kosher animals. I think we talked about that as well, right? The Torah says you can't eat the sciatic nerve in certain parts of the animal. That's why there's no kosher sirloin. Certain fats are not kosher. Uh, in America, they just cut the animal in half and the second half just goes to a non-kosher division of the company. Methods of absorption of taste. That's what I just spoke about, um, right? It has to be, um, uh, I maybe skip the important part. It has to be hot, okay? Taste only moves if things are very hot. I think I left that out, that's important. So things have to be piping hot in order for taste to be imparted. So if you have um, your dairy spoon resting inside your meat pot, like on the counter and they're cold, that's fine. Um, if your dairy, if your meat, if your meat, uh, your chicken soup is in the refrigerator and it's cold, you take it out of the fridge and a block of cheese falls into it, that's fine. Like take the cheese out, rinse off the cheese. Cheese is fine, soup is fine because it's cold, okay? Assuming you can actually get it, you know, clean, you know, right? But there's no worry, we're, you know, we have to make sure it's oily or greasy. If there's actual food substance on it, that's a problem. But in terms of the transfer of taste, transfer of taste doesn't happen when things are cold, only when they're piping hot which is also, by the way, a, a huge source of leniency when accidents occur. Usually one or both of the vessels, the pots, pans, spoons, forks, knives had not been used for 24 hours prior to the accidents. And usually or often the food is not piping hot. So it's also further grounds for leniency. So those are other rules of how the food, the, the taste is transferred. Okay. So that was, um, what was that? That was, um, that was Roman numeral four, 
letter, um, letter C. Mishra's meat and milk. I think I sort of, we sort of alluded to that, but the Torah says don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. And we understand that to mean you can't cook uh, any dairy or meat together or eat any dairy and meat that's been cooked together uh, or drive benefit for a dairy and meat that's been cooked together. Uh, and so we don't mix them. And therefore we don't, you know, we don't even cook meat and, and pots that have used to cook dairy because the dairy absorbed in the pots will come out. Skipping over E for a moment, F is what I just mentioned, notein tam lif gam, okay? Meaning like you have uh, items that are, um, uh, once the taste becomes rancid after 24 hours. And so it can't actually, so you, which means by the way, if somebody, you know, makes it, make a pot of pasta in a non-kosher pot, if that non-kosher pot had not been used for 24 hours, the pasta is actually kosher, right? Um, uh, this is that's because, because the pot had not been, right? Whatever, whatever you know, it, it's my lobster pot, but I haven't cooked a lobster in 24 hours. And now I make a pot of pasta. The pasta is absolutely kosher because the lobster taste that was imparted into the pasta is rancid lobster taste. And a rancid taste can't um, render something non-kosher. So why do you need kosher pots, you may ask, if you can just write. So the answer is, it's a rabbinic decree that you don't, 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 don't go out and ab initio, don't, don't like from the outset, cook, use non-kosher pots and pans. But Yevid, after the fact, if something is cooked in a non-kosher pot or pan, so long as that non-kosher pot or pan, had not been used 24 hours, the resulting food is kosher. So you go over to your, you know, um, aunt, uh, great aunt Esther's house and she's, you know, and she doesn't have a kosher kitchen. She's, oh, thanks for visiting. I, I made you a pot of pasta. So it's already cooked. That pasta is actually kosher, right? She already cooked it. And you can't use a pot to cook. It's forbidden rabbinically. The rabbi said, don't use a non-kosher pot to cook. But once it's already cooked, it is actually kosher. Or if you ask, or if you more commonly, is, oh my gosh, I cooked my this in the wrong pot. So probably it's fine because that pot was not used for 24 hours. Um, sometimes the pot was used for the 24 hours, then that leniency doesn't apply. But usually in, in a private home, it wasn't, and you can assume it wasn't. In a restaurant, you have to assume it was used, right? Restaurants use things constantly and you can't assume that there's a rest. Uh, you know, 24 hour period has elapsed. Uh, I guess uh, if it's like, if the restaurant closes one day a week and they reopen, I guess you could assume that none, none of the pots and pans, you know, you're the first at the first meal after the restaurant has been closed for the weekend or a holiday weekend, you know, whatever, you can assume that uh, um, I, I guess the food would be uh, more kosher than other times. But generally this leniency can't, doesn't work for commercial kitchens. Um, and the reason why the rabbis say they made this prohibition against eating, uh, cooking, sorry, the cooking in a pot that has not been used 24 hours is lest you come to cook in a pot that was used within 24 hours, which is a, a reasonable enough, you know, extension to make. That's why it's a rabbinic extension of this biblical rule of how taste is imparted and sure. Okay, next. Um, uh, that was, okay, that was, um, that was A, B, C, D, F. Let's talk about E, bugs. The Torah says you can't eat insects, okay? You can't eat creepy crawlies, only animals you can eat are like the kosher animals, cows and goats and sheep. You can't eat uh, bugs or any, any other creepy crawly, rats, whatever. Uh, but insects and fast food, okay? Like the vegetables we eat have little insects in them. If they're microscopic, they, they're not, they don't count. But if you can see them with your own eyes, then they are a problem and uh, you have to like try to see them. You have to look, okay? Uh, I recommend soaking uh, vegetables in like a, in water with a little bit of vinegar. The vinegar is supposed to like stun the bugs and makes them not able to stick onto the, to the, uh, to the vegetables very well. And then you rinse it very vigorously in a colander with like high pressure, you know, streaming water. Um, and, then, and then you cook it. Um, you know, some people are more strict about that even and they use special lights and, and you know, to remove these bugs. Um, I, I think, um, I think you have to be able to see it with a naked eye in order for them to be a problem with kosher food. And even so, um, so I, I, I'm not sure that's necessary, but you should have to, you have to check for them. You have to clean them pretty, clean vegetables carefully. Um, fish and meat. Uh, the, the Talmud says we don't eat fish and meat together. Uh, the Talmud presents that as being a, a rule based on, um, uh, the Talmud says it's dangerous. It's dangerous to eat. Um, fish and meat together. It doesn't say why it's dangerous. Um, so it's a little strange, uh, um, like a, a strange uh, 
statement in the Talmud, right? Because we don't really know why it's dangerous. We don't, we don't experience it as dangerous. Um, one explanation I heard is that it's, it's like uh, to have two kinds of animal protein at one meal is like haughty and, and arrogant and will invite the evil eye. People will be jealous if, if you eat fish and meat at the same meal. Um, so that is the thing. We avoid fish and meat at the same meal. The way we do that is by um, um, doing a separate, you know, clearing the table, right? Like separate, don't eat them together. So maybe you have gefilte fish will be served as the first course. There'll be a fish course and the plates are taken away and rinsed or put aside. If you have fish forks, they're taken away or if they're just regular forks, you wash them before you turn them to the table. Uh, some people will have a lachai and have some shops or whatever, just or rinse out their mouths in some other way between the fish course and the meat course. Okay, we don't have fish and meat at the same time. Again, it's not, it's not a kosher thing. The Talmud just says it's dangerous, and so and so we don't do it, even though we don't really know why it's we have no reason to think that it's that it's dangerous. Um, okay, moving on. I questioned anything I said before. So far, I'm going very fast. I realize I apologize if it's a little too fast. Any questions or comments? Is there anything surprising? Doesn't have to be surprising. Sorry. Okay. So how to kosher things? I sort of alluded to this earlier. Um, um, the rule of koshering is the way things go in, that's how they go out. So, um, so things that become contaminated, uh, right, koshering to make kosher, things that become contaminated by uh, being by boiling water, like you put this spoon in the wrong pot, so it can be koshered by, by boiling water. Things that become contaminated by being directly over the heat, like you have a skewer that you used to roast a whatever over an open fire, that has to be koshered by getting right, red hot in the fire itself. Skewers are hard to kosher. Or your barbecue grills, right? The food goes directly on the grates um, at very hot temperatures. So you need to get them like at red hot temperatures, maybe even using a blowtorch to kosher your barbecue grills. Um, most things you would cook with water, with liquid, with some liquid medium for cooking. And so you can kosher them by immerse, immersing them in boiling water, in a larger pot of boiling water. Um, you have to wait, you should wait 24 hours and you immerse in the pot of boiling water and then it's good to go. Um, Ovens are kosher by putting them up. If it's a self-cleaning oven, you can just run the self-cleaning cycle, or you just put the oven to the very hottest temperature it gets, let it get to that temperature for a few minutes, and that um, burns out the, the kind of like, you know, whatever, whatever tastes were absorbed in the walls of the oven, then get expelled in that way. Um, you know, we're, we don't really cook directly in ovens, right? We cook in platters or on, right, in pots in the oven or, Right, on, a, on a tray in the oven. So that's also like, you know, there really should not, not be food directly cooked on the oven. The ancient world time, they, they, they cooked directly on the walls of the oven. Like they baked bread on the inside walls of ovens. Ovens were big con cones or, 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 or domes made out of ceramic material. And they would attach the dough of the bread they were baking to the um, inner wall of the oven. That's how it baked, right? And so we don't do that, right? Food doesn't really touch the walls of the oven. So Makes it a little bit easier to kosher, but that should be done. Um, there are different ways of cooking dairy and meat in the same oven. You can have one covered and one uncovered. Maybe dairy is uncovered and meat is always covered. And then if you want to switch and have your meat uncovered, you just either wait 24 hours or burn out the oven. Like put it put the oven to a hotter temperature than it was used. So you cooked uh, lasagna 350 degrees, then you want to roast the chicken at 400. So bring the oven up. So take lasagna out, put the oven up to 400, uh, let it get to that temperature. And then you can cook your roasted chicken afterwards also uncovered. Okay, and that, 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 that works as well in the same oven. Again, that the added leniency to our ovens because we're not actually putting, the food is not directly touching the oven. Um, if it's a barbecue grill or something like that where your food is actually touching the, the heating element itself, then, it, then we can't be it so, so lenient. Microwaves are kind of strange. Microwaves, um, there's no heat in a microwave, right? The, the heat comes from the food itself, right? The microwaves agitate the molecules in the food and they, the kinetic energy becomes thermal energy, whatever, and the, the, the heat comes from the item itself. But you still have splatters of piping hot food substance kind of splattering around. So we do, do one type of food, either dairy or meat uncovered and one type always covered. That's what we do to keep splattering stuff from like reaching the walls, at least one, right? So the, we, we do dairy uncovered and meat covered in our, in our microwave. So 
any meat that splatters up gets hits the cover and no meat should touch the walls in the microwave. Again, the walls in the microwave don't get hot, so it's unclear why well, we have to be worried anyway, but you know, whatever, they, it gets steamy in there and who knows. So that, that's what we do. At the kosher microwave, you just clean it out thoroughly and boil a cup of water for like four or five minutes. You have steam filling the microwave and that, that's, that's what we do to kosher it, which is, again, it's sort of a invented method, but uh, that, that's sort of what, what's become common um, to do with microwaves. Um, for sinks, we use sink liner, some sort of like a wire rack that sits on the inside of the sink so that you don't have dirty dishes resting on the sink itself. Because then if you have, uh, imagine you, you're washing dishes and piping hot water on your dish in the sink and then the meat gets absorbed to the walls of the sink and then the next meal is a dairy meal and you're washing dishes again, now piping hot and the dairy there is in the sink and it gets absorbed, right? So we just don't, you just lift the plates off the floor of the sink. So the sink is absorbing whatever taste is absorbing, but the dishes are never resting directly on, on the sink itself. And so um, that's not gonna be a concert, a concern. So you get a dairy one, you get a meat one, different colors, and you, you put them in the, uh, in the sink as you cook those items. There's one further leniency with a sink. I should have mentioned this earlier, and that's that soap. You usually use soap when you wash. Hopefully, you use soap when you wash. You ever tasted soap? Good. Thanks for the thanks for the face, Noel. Okay, soap does not taste good, right? So, if you have some, uh, yeah, you had a meat meal, and your dish has the residue of your meat meal, and you're washing it with soap, so the meat on that dish is mixing with the soap, and it tastes pretty bad, which means that the taste that is then subsequently absorbed into whatever else is washed with it or in the sink, et cetera, is going to be a nasty, rancid, unpleasant taste. And so it's not gonna be a kosher concern. Okay, if you accidentally wash, you know, let's say you're, you, we use our dishwasher for, um, uh, oh wait, that's a good question. Wait, sorry, wait, 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 wait. The question was, you have the, I don't like cilantro. Um, that's a very good question. So you don't like cilantro, so if cilantro is, Without, you, you, if you just like cook everything with cilantro, you, like, why would you, you wouldn't like it? But if somebody comes in, let's say you have a non-Jewish roommate comes and uh, cooks with cilantro, makes a cilantro pork chops. And so your, your, your um, pot now absorbs this cilantro infused um, pork taste. Since you find that a revolting taste, maybe it's not a posture problem for you. I, I think we don't say that. I think we say that we, we, we go according to like what most people would find unpleasant. Most people like cilantro. Um, I believe that's the case. So it's a good, it's a good question because what about, you know, because you could have things which are, you could have things which taste good, but don't but taste bad in context. Like, you know, um, you know, whatever, like cumin is, is, is a great flavor, but not in your breakfast cereal, uh, right? So, just, so if, you know, so, so like and that, that is discussed in the Talmud, I believe, or certainly in the rabbinic sources, um, right? What about contextually? Thing, you know, the thing, the thing may taste fine, but when mixed with this way, it doesn't taste fine. So I think, I think there we'd say that if, if in this particular mixture it makes it worse, then it's not a kosher. So you have non-kosher cumin that goes into your breakfast cereal. The breakfast cereal is still going to be kosher, even if you can taste the cumin, because cumin is an unpleasant. Um, taste in breakfast cereal. Uh, does that make sense? Or, yeah. So is, is a Brillo pad that has soap in it, you can use it for either, because that's rancid? So I, I, I wouldn't recommend using it for either, but if you did, it would be fine, okay? And uh, we, we, yeah, we, we don't do it, but, but we really, you could. Sorry, I'm reaching down, I'm you know, plugging my, my phone. Um, but if you did, it would be fine. And so that, that's, and so generally, whenever there's an accident, that occurs, like a cash accident that occurs in the context of washing dishes, it's almost always not going to be a problem because hopefully we use soap and therefore the taste is rancid. So let's say we use our dishwasher for dairy uh, dishes and stuff. So if you, but every so often, you know, it's not unheard of, you know, somebody accidentally puts a meat fork in. So the meat fork that's washed with, um, that's washed with dairy dishes is going to, um, uh, it comes out of the dishwasher, it's fine. Because yeah, it was in there with the soapy water and that 
very hot temperatures with all those dairy foods was mixed with soap. And so the taste, whatever taste they may have absorbed or imparted is rancid. And so, you know, I recommend you, you can like take your dishwasher powder and just sprinkle a little extra powder in the dishwasher so that as just a routine, always, every single load. So that just in case you forgot and there's the wrong type of fork cut, put in the dishwasher, as soon as the cycle begins, even before the thing opens up, there's like, there's soap there and like, it's always rancid from the beginning. And then if accidentally you discover the wrong thing up in there, it's gonna be fine. Um, there's another reason why dishwashing, it's something hand dishwashing is gonna be lenient. Figure it out. You can't figure it out because I didn't tell you, you're missing a piece of information. I'll tell you, okay? When you're washing by hands, the temperature is not going to be piping hot. Okay, if you're hand washing dishes, by definition, it's not piping hot. You say, what do you mean? I, I wash dishes with very hot water. So the definition that Talmud uses for really hot water that's so hot that taste can transfer is water that's so hot that your hand recoils from it. <laughs> that you can't put your hand, you put your hands, you go, oh, wow, that, that was hot. Okay, so whatever temperature that is, it's too hot to wash dishes by hand. Okay, so unless some people, you know, you can maybe you hold your hand, you have gloves on, and you're holding your hand outside, you know, like sort of holding the dish from the side, right? Like, you know, under the sink, and it's really, really hot. So that, okay, that might be out to let it. That might be so hot that taste could transfer. But if you're like hands are in there washing the dishes, scrubbing them, um, it's um, by definition, again, really like, oops, I, this is a meat fork. Uh oh. Uh, it, it's going to be fine because you're washing your hand. It's not hot enough for taste to transfer. So just make sure the actual food residue is cleaned off well, and then you don't, you don't have to be concerned about taste that was invisibly, uh, imperceptibly absorbed into the fork or whatever that you're washing. Okay. Um, all right. Let's go back. Let's see. If we can do do one more. Uh, um, Fish and me, cognitive uh, air sink, microwave, dishwasher, guests, housekeepers. Maybe we'll pause. Maybe we'll, you know, we'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do I. We'll finish that. And we'll do J and then we'll pause. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, what do you want to say? I would say, in terms of people in your home who, so if, if, if you have other observant shoes in your house, then it's very easy because they know not to mess around your kitchen without asking, right? If you go to someone else's house, you say, like, wait, which is, is this your dairy, you know, dishes? Like, where can I put, you know, clean the table in someone's house? Like, where can I put this dish down? Like, you can't just assume, find the surface and put it there, right? Because, you know, there may be places where it belongs and places where it doesn't belong. Uh, if people have in your home, if they're also observant Jews, then they're going to know also. But if they're not, you have guests, relatives, friends, whatever. So tell them, okay? You just got to tell, or a housekeeper or someone who does, right? Just tell them. Um, don't be shy about it. It's uh, not all that abnormal in the scheme of things, right? This is a 21st century multicultural America. Everyone does something strange. This is your thing. Um, respectful people will, re will be respectful. And you can just say like, you know, we only use these dishes for this. We wash these dishes with this red sponge or whatever. Um, in terms of house, in terms of um, nannies or babysitters, maybe it's easier just to like not have them do meat cooking and, you know, or, or, or you know, I, I made lunch, you know, to feed the baby. You know, heat it up in this, you know, in the in the microwave with, on this plate. Uh, when you're done, wash it. Just stick it in the sink. I wash it. You know, just to keep things simple. In our experience of having, you know, I've been a parent, thank God, for almost 15 years, and we've had like babysitters and nannies who like really, really gotten it quickly. And some who haven't, but like most people who are like reasonably intelligent can, can figure this out. And so, as you're orienting them to your kitchen as a friend or a house guest or a housekeeper or a nanny, or just you'll tell them, you know, what, what to do and where to put things. Um, I do get a lot of phone calls, like that's actually that's a common source of like Kashru collisions when, you know, my mother-in-law came in and she mistakenly did this or the housekeeper, you know, brought her own food where she heated in the microwave where she, you know, she was supposed to heat the baby's food in this, but she heated the baby's food in that. And, you know, so we, so, okay, so call me when that happens and we'll figure it out. And hopefully not, you know, the consequences are not so dire, but uh, it's in terms of just like a Best practice is just be really upfront and really honest and explain. And um, you could label things. We, we um, years ago, my wife and I rented an apartment uh, from another observant Jewish family and they just put post-its all over the kitchen, uh, which we kept up for like, I don't know, two or three months until we like really knew the kitchen well, uh, just explaining, explaining like where, what were the dairy dishes and where the meat dishes were and 
and the utensils. And that was really helpful for us because then we could, you know, find, uh, you know, you know, we could like walk into there. We could, you know, it was the August 1st when the rental began, we could walk into their apartment and, uh, you know, and, and, and cook and cook for ourselves because everything had a little post-it attached to it. Um, so you could do that too. Questions, comments on this? Okay, great. So I'll pause now. Um, um, I hope uh, to see you guys actually in Shul at any point that is you know, soon. Um, and if, I, if you have any follow questions that you, I can answer, please reach out to me individually um, via email or some other medium. And uh, thank you so much. I don't know yet, I, I, I don't, I'll have to put the next class on the schedule probably, I don't know, we can maybe meet second half of July. I'll, I'll put it, I'll put it, I'll put the, we'll put the classes on the schedule soon, I hope, okay? But take care everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming, have a good night.